Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We just want to welcome you to our event on um, the North Carolina legislative environment and how that's affecting the environment. This is co-sponsored by the American Constitution Society, the Environmental Law Society, and DUGI through the Nicholas Institute. So just to do a brief introduction of our panelists, um, first we have Ellie Kinnaird, who was a senator for eight terms for the 23rd District in North Carolina, which is uh, in Orange and Chatham Counties. Uh, before that, she was mayor of Carborough, during which time she also got her law degree from North Carolina Central University. She is a strong advocate of education, voter rights, and social justice. Next, two people over, we have Mary McLean Aspill. She is a lawyer lobbyist at the Southern Environmental Law Center. She got her law degree from the University of Georgia, and then she was an attorney at Kilpatrick Stockton. Um, at SCLC, Mary McLean spends a lot of time at the legislature lobbying on a wide range of environmental issues facing the Southeast, including fracking, wetlands protection, uh, pollution controls on drinking water, and habitats. And then next up, we've got Brooks Pearson, who's also a lawyer lobbyist at SCLC. Um, Brooks has a joint master's degree in urban planning and a law degree from UNC. And after law school, worked at the Nicholas Institute for two years doing energy policy work. And then we've also got, lastly, Professor Purdy, who teaches constitutional law, environmental law, property law, writes on all three of those subjects, and also was the author this summer of an editorial in the Huffington Post entitled why I got arrested in Raleigh, the states are the new front line, which I think will inform his discussion a bit today as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Senator Kinnaird to give us some background on the laws at issue here. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your, your inviting me and your interest. And, and we're family. We work for many years together uh, fighting the good fight. It's and, a small uh, family. Uh, a small <laughs> family of uh, people who lobby and who care about the environment. Just a, a minor correction, because that's probably something that I haven't updated. I was in nine terms. And one of the things I worked on was environmental work. And as, especially when I was the mayor of Carborough, we passed the strictest watershed rules in the state of North Carolina to protect our watershed. And we worked on other things. So I have had a long history in, in, in the environment, working again in the legislature. And I must say that I was there during the golden age and uh, we could get things done, and we did get things done. And I'm going to talk about one of them, which is the mega landfills. And then, of course, I left when it all fell apart, and they dismantled 17 years of my work in the legislature, including the uh, environmental measures that I had passed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the mega landfills. And when I say a mega landfill, it would be as high as 350 feet and several football lengths. In, in size. And uh, somebody told me that they have these in Florida and that you'll be traveling along in a very flat area and all of a sudden you'll come to this mountain and that's one of those mega landfills. So we, in 2007, suddenly discovered that a national waste industry had bought five sites to put up these mega landfills and some of them were to be at sea level, two of them. And we know that the leachate from these is not completely controlled. And here we are at, at sea level and wetlands and marshes and all that sort of thing. So it very well could threaten the eco ecosystem. And of course, we also know they were next to low income minority neighborhoods because that's where land is inexpensive. And all of a sudden, here they were. And what was more disturbing was that the waste was coming not from North Carolina, not from neighboring counties, from, from New York and New Jersey, because of course they have run out of landfill space, contrary to North Carolina, where they saw, if you'll pardon the expression, <coughs> green pastures. So what happened is, of course, we were very alarmed. We knew the threat to the ecosystem. We knew the threat to these minority neighborhoods where they'd have trucks rumbling through and rats and odors and all that sort of thing. So we decided we would try to see what we could do to at least mitigate them and, and, and at best keep them out. Now, the US Supreme Court has decided that garbage is interstate commerce, and therefore no state can refuse garbage from any other state. So we needed to find a way to protect the environment and protect those sensitive neighborhoods. So we passed a comprehensive bill 
that would create buffers around these sensitive areas. S-1492 first established the circumstances under which the Department of the Environment and Natural Resources, henceforth DENER, could den must deny a permit application. It increased the financial responsibility requirements for applicants and permit holders and held them responsible for the financial qualification for design, construction, operation, and maintenance. And they had to put up a certain financial demonstration and that had to be audited and it was certified. So it required cost estimates to protect these sites and a five-year phasing and closure financial responsibility, including remediation if pollution occurred. And a minimum of three million in environmental compliance was required. These are the things that it addressed. The disposable of combustion product, products, including a double liner for coal ash. And coal ash is a serious pollutant. We've even had a, a mountain area where a, um, uh, the, the, the uh, Actually, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a private one, and it wasn't Duke. I'm trying to think of what it was. Um, TVA. TVA, thank you. Uh, where it actually collapsed and went down into a village in the rivers. And it expanded the scope of environmental review requirements. Buffers of at least 200 feet between any perennial stream or wetland and the nearest waste disposal unit of a sanitary landfill. And the construction disposal also required a liner of a certain permeability with two feet of soil, test drains, and leachate. And it prohibited construction in a 100-year floodplain or wetland, some exceptions, or within five miles of a na national refuge chain. So uh, one mile from a state game land, two miles from a state park. So this act prohibited a landfill of more than 55 million cubic yards of waste or an area of 350 acres, and a maximum height of 250 feet. Well. That's really not a whole lot of help, but it was some help. And this protected neighborhoods, and it meant that it, these buffers prevented them from building, building in close proximity to very environmentally sensitive areas. Well, along came 2013, and the legislature turned over completely. So one of the things that they decided was that this was not good because no, uh, no, landfill had been constructed. And of course, that was the point. We <laughs> wanted that. And so what happened was they began dismantling this. And one by one, they dismantled these. And I was listening, I was in that committee, when I heard them say, section one repealed, section two repealed, section three repealed, and on and on and on until they actually devastated what we had put in place. And what we think is going to happen is that these mega landfills will be allowed because all of those things that I told you about, except a couple of exceptions, I think it's um, within a mile of the, uh, the state park and um, two miles from the, from the state park and a mile from a, a game land or the wild, wild west refuge are, are still in place. But all of the rest of it was systematically dismantled. So what we can find out is that soon this will happen here in North Carolina. When we're debating it, the sponsor talked about how wonderful this was because it's gonna bring industry and none of these landfills have been able to be built until now. And so I asked her, I said, Senator, would you like for one of these to be built in your neighborhood? I don't think I want one in my neighborhood. I don't think any of the members of the General Assembly would want them in their neighborhood. And she said, oh, we don't want those neighborhoods to lose out on jobs. I thought, jobs? How about IT jobs? How about pharmaceutical jobs? Why garbage is jobs for a minority community? And I was appalled. Well, we didn't stop it. It is going forward, and they are writing new regulations as we speak. And so what we may see very sadly is that these mega landfills could be built. And it, this is only symptomatic, as you'll hear from many of these others, of what happened last time and why we are in great danger in this state as far as the environment and the ecology is concerned. And I hope that 2014 is coming up. And I realize that I can't talk politics, but do remember and remember it's hard to vote and hard to register. 
and hard to have an ID. A lot of you are probably from out of state, but if you can vote here, we'll tell you all about how you can vote. So thank you very much. All right, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about actually quite a bit, about fracking. Um, fracking is hydraulic fracturing. It's a method of natural gas extraction that I'm sure you are all familiar with, unless you've been living in a, under a rock the past several years. So a brief history in North Carolina. In 2009, the North Carolina Geologic Survey announced the presence of shale gas in North Carolina and the deep and Dan River basins, which underlie 12 counties in North Carolina. Three counties, Lee, Chatham, and Moore, have the bulk of the resource underneath them. But gas companies had already been here since about 2006, leasing land. In Lee County, there are currently about 80 active leases that cover about 9,300 acres. So in 2012, the North Carolina General Assembly legalized fracking um, and overrode a veto of then-Governor Bev Perdue. This rolled back state laws um, dating back to 1945 that prohibited horizontal drilling and the ejection of any waste into a well, which created a de facto ban on hydraulic fracturing. The law also placed a moratorium on the issuance of permits until the General Assembly could take legislative action following um, the creation of regulations by the Mining and Energy Commission. So because North Carolina has no active oil and gas production, or has not up until this point, there is no comprehensive, comprehensive regulatory program to govern um, the oil and gas industry. And the law therefore reconstituted the North Carolina Mining Commission as the Mining and Energy Commission and charged that body with creating the rules that would govern the practice. The MEC is divided into six committees that draft the rules that are then voted on by the full commission. And the MEC also has study groups, which are comprised of MEC members and other interested stakeholders that look at specific issues. Um, and the full set of regulations is scheduled for completion in October 2014, and we expect to see the legislature take these rules up in the long session in 2015. In 2013, um, we saw in the legislative session this year, we saw repeated attempts to lift the moratorium on issuing drilling permits until the safety rules are in place and the legislature votes to approve the rules. And one of these bills, Senate Bill 76, known for most of the session as the fracking bill, but they called it the Domestic Energy and Jobs Act. That's the one that ultimately passed and became law in July 2013. But the final version of the bill does not include some of the worst fracking provisions proposed by the Senate, including the fast tracking of permitting before regulations are completed and underground injection of fracking wastes. So as introduced, the bill would have allowed for injecting the flowback fluid in produced waters, which is the waste of the fracking operation, into underground wells, deep underground. And this would have rolled back 40 years of state law. From 1968 to 1972, a company called Hercules that manufactured raw materials for the production of polyester fabric, I'm sure that was really big in the 70s. Um, <laughs> they used the coastal aquifers of North Carolina for chemical injection. And the wells, of course, predictably clogged and leached chemicals into the aquifer. So the, the underground leakage led to the state banning um, the injection of waste underground in North Carolina. In 2012, in a Diener report, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources issued a report that urged against legalizing the deep disposal of fracking wastes. And our state geologist says that the underground geology in most of the state is not porous enough to absorb these fluids. And further, an EPA assessment of industrial waste injection sites nationwide classified Western North Carolina as unfavorable under all conditions and Eastern North Carolina is unfavorable under most conditions for underground injection. So because of that, we assumed that these wastes would be trucked to the coast and injected there where the geology is not good, but at least it's possible for the underground geology to absorb these fluids. Though as we saw in the early 70s, leaks into the aquifers. So the environmental lobby and some wonderful legislators were able to fight back that provision. The coastal. coastal. The coastal legislators really stepped up and were very vocal in their opposition Somebody. on both sides of the aisle, so, <laughs> with a couple of ex notable exceptions who will remain unnamed. 
unless you want to know later, I'll tell you. Um, and the local governments also really stepped up. Um, we uh, drafted some resolutions that local governments passed um, to send to their uh, representatives urging them to please not truck the waste to the coast and inject the waste there where they were receiving or would receive none of the benefit of the natural gas extraction. The bill also would have prohibited local governments from taxing any aspect of oil and gas extraction, which would hinder the ability of local governments to adequately address the negative impacts of oil and gas exploration in their borders. But that provision also was not in the version that passed. Senate Bill 76, as introduced, would have, would have eliminated the requirement that Diener establish a registry of landmen operating in North Carolina. So those are the um, representatives who go sit at the kitchen table and have coffee with the landowners and talk them into signing a lease. Um, and without a registry of landmen, Diener would have not have any information about who these people are operating in North Carolina and landowners would not be able to see their record and see if they have, for example, a criminal record in another state or if they had acted, um, had been a bad actor in another state. So the final version of the bill, instead of getting rid of this um, directory, instead directed the MEC to study the issue of whether we should have a registry of landmen. So the final Senate Bill 76, we were pretty proud that a lot of the worst stuff did not get into it. Um, but on the final days of session, I believe the day before session ended, there was a last ditch effort to pass a bill that would lift the moratorium on permitting. And that language was inserted into Senate Bill 127, which dealt with the reorganization of the North Carolina Department of Commerce. Um, and this attempt also failed. House Bill 74, which was signed into law in August 19, not 19, 2013, also 1913 would be great, we wouldn't have to worry about it, also <laughs> touches on the fracking issue because it weakens protections of groundwater and it limits local government um, from passing environmental ordinances, but I'm not going to discuss that bill because Mary McLean is going to discuss it in much detail. Um, we expect to see more energy legislation in the 2014 short session, which convenes in mid-May and is likely, um, will likely wrap up by the end of June. There were rumors that Governor McCrory would convene a special session to deal with energy issues, but we no longer think that is likely. And as for what we expect to see next session, well, they could certainly try to lift the moratorium again. We will be watching for that. Other topics we might see is forced pooling. So forced pooling or compulsory pooling is used to create a drilling unit by forcing non-consenting landowners to sign leases to join a proposed drilling unit. Gas companies like it because it maximizes recovery, but it takes away a property owner's right to control his or her own mineral resource. Um, and though many states do authorize forced pooling, it is not necessary for fracking to occur. For example, Pennsylvania and West Virginia, both of which contain the Marcellus Shale, do not allow forced pooling. The North Carolina Oil and Gas Conservation Act authorizes the use of forced pooling in North Carolina, but it is silent on the details of how this should be accomplished. And so we expect the legislature to act to clear that up. For example, what is the minimum acreage of um, land that must be leased in order to pull everyone else into, um, to force them into leases. Senate Bill 820, the bill that legalized fracking in 2012, directed the MEC to study the issue of forced pooling and to report its findings and recommendations to the legislature. And so the MEC formed a compulsory pooling study group that submitted their recommendations to the full MEC ahead of their October 1st deadline this year. Um, and they recommended a 90% acreage requirement, which in Lee County, because there are very large tracts of land, because it is rural, that could still force pool 55% of landowners. So over half of landowners could be forced into leases. Although Diener submitted the report to the Joint Legislative Commission on Energy Policy and the Environmental Review Commission, as was planned, they recommended that the legislature wait and decide the details of forced pooling once they have the entire suite of rules before them, 
which is expected um, in October 2014. So we're not sure that that is going to come up this session, but we'll be watching for it. Another thing to watch for is waste disposal. Um, the MEC is working on this issue, but we're going to watch for it just in case the legislature decides to move forward ahead of the MEC, which they have not been afraid to do in the past. Um, over years of gas production, a single well can produce millions of gallons of waste fluid, um, and they contain many pollutants, and the MEC is really struggling to determine the best way to dispose of these wastes. As I discussed earlier, we don't have a very good geology for injecting it underground, which is considered the safest method of disposal if you have the appropriate geology for it. Um, other options include treating it at publicly owned treatment works and discharging it into surface waters, um, land application, commercial wastewater treatment, and reuse in future fracking operations. Senate Bill 76 directed the MEC to conduct three additional studies. So we might see legislation pertaining to the results of those studies in the next couple of sessions. And those are coordinated permitting, severance taxes, and the landmen registry issue. So yesterday, I spent the day over at the legislature observing committee meetings. And yesterday, the Joint Legislative Commission on Energy Policy invited several industry groups to speak to them. Um, the American Petroleum Industry, I'm sorry, the American Petroleum Institute, and an attorney who works with the American Natural Gas Association and the International Oil and Gas Convention um, came to speak and they provided recommendations as to what they would like to see the North Carolina legislature do next session. And based on that presentation, we're going to watch out for um, weakening of landowner protections. They were clear that they think North Carolina landowner protections are too strong and are going to scare away industry. Um, and will create an economic disincentive for industry. Um, they also recommended that we develop incentives to attract the industry here, including discovery well tax incentives, high cost well payout provisions, and secondary recovery tax credits to incentivize extraction. So. Talk about the environmental groups that weren't there. <laughs> Yeah, what did you get to say? <laughs> I was not invited to give recommendations of what I would like to see next session, nor was any other environmental groups. Um, it was industry group after industry group, with one exception, um, Ted Feitschan of the North Carolina Cooperative Extension was invited to speak about um, mineral estates, and he gave a very nonpartisan, unbiased, very good presentation. Um, so one of our colleagues says that vigilance is the cost of freedom, so we will be... <laughs> watching out to see what we can do to protect our water and our land. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Mary McLean. Hi, thanks for having me. Francesca, thank you so much for putting this together and inviting us. We had the pleasure of working with Francesca this summer at our office at SELC. And then I also see a couple of other members of the family, Senator Knarn, two interns that worked with the League of Conservation Voters this summer. So it's great to see you guys again, and we miss you. Um, before I moved back to my beautiful home state of North Carolina, I was in Atlanta, Georgia for a long time. And whilst there, I had a job very similar to Reich's, Professor Longus. I ran the environmental law clinic at Emory University. So I have um, long loved speaking to law students and seeing this many of y'all interested in environmental laws and rules and just the issues is great. And it gives me so much comfort because... <laughs> I wish y'all would all run for office. That would be super, so maybe put that on your list. Um, as a general matter, when Francesca told us what this panel was about, Brooks and I were talking about all of the crazy environmental legislation we saw happen, both in the 2013 session and really in the 2011-2012 session as well. So there's some handouts up here at the front. I'll probably just leave them. It's not a very helpful place for y'all to get them right now, but I've got two documents. One is a summary Brooks and I did of the main bad pieces of environmental legislation that occurred this session, and it's five pages long, boiled down. And then we've also made a one-pager, which as you can see by the font, took us a really long time to make it this small, of the dismantling of environmental protections in North Carolina. And that goes from 2011 through today. And, it, you know, they're bullet points, but it really is shocking to get it all on one sheet of paper, and we can't even call it the top 10 or even the top 20. 
We call it the list of horribles. Yeah, there's no there's no cute number for how many things there are. But so feel free to take these, talk to people about them, you know, expand our choir. Uh, it's it's very depressing, but it's really important. And the more we let people know, the better. But anyway, my specific subject for today is another really long laundry list called House Bill 74. And it was one of the biggest bills this past session, and it was also one of the last bills to get passed by both chambers and then to ultimately get signed by the governor. Um, it's called the Regulatory Reform Act of 2013. And just as sort of a historical backdrop, Starting in 2011, when the shift in the House and Senate in North Carolina occurred, one of the main mantras we he started hearing these legislators say was, North Carolina has too many regulations. They're killing us, in, especially environmental regulations. They kill jobs, despite the fact that we were year after year ranked number three, number two by all these great mm -hmm. magazines and newspapers of the best place to live, the best place to run a business, the best place to recreate, and the combination thereof. They still, they just, it was just something they'd been told to say and they just kept saying it. Rules kill jobs. So we saw a lot of regulatory reform in 2011 and 2012, a lot of um, amendments to the Administrative Procedure Act, a lot of limitations on passing environmental laws, rules, excuse me, and uh, just budget cuts, all sorts of things that impacted regulations as we know them in North Carolina. But that wasn't enough. So they came in with a vengeance in 2013 and had this bill that was really just one topic at the beginning when it started, House Bill 74. It was sponsored by Representative Tom Murray in Western Wake County, Representative Tim Moffitt in Buncombe County, so in the Asheville area, Representative Ruth Samuelson in Charlotte, and Representative Rob Bryan in Charlotte, as well an attorney in Charlotte and many, many co-sponsors. But the point of House Bill 74 at the very beginning was to work on eliminating rule, you know, getting rid of some rules in North Carolina. And the very first, I think it may have been one of the first committee meetings we went to of the whole session where they rolled it out. They hadn't consulted with the agencies. It didn't really seem as though they'd consulted with counsel. I guess they had with research staff, who's usually pretty spiffy on these issues. But at any rate, their idea was that in 2016, all the health regulations are going to be uh, revisited, and any that aren't will be repealed. 2017, same for all the environmental regulations. 2018, all the um, licensing board and commission rules and regulations. And then 2019 was like everything else or something, and they just didn't really have a very good plan for it. So we raised a ruckus, um, got senators and House members to work with us, and, and sat down and met with some of the sponsors and said, this is untenable. You've got to make a better plan for this. You're, you're not going to be able to do this. There's 23,000 rules in North Carolina. You've got to come up with a better plan. So they kind of went away for the rest of the session to work on this. Well, as the session went on, several other bills came up, Senate Bill 612, Senate Bill 112, and House Bill 94, various iterations of reg reform, but also amend environmental laws. There were provisions in there to eliminate buffers on many of the um, river basins in North Carolina. Uh, these, these bills were huge, and they ultimately were all rolled into House 74, different parts of them. So. We called it a grab bag of special interest provisions. In the end, House Bill 74 had 60 sections, and, and we had fought many of these sections all session long, and they ended up all in one bill. Um, many of these were non-environmental issues, so that's what made it a difficult bill. Some people just had to support it. There was a provision in there about installing carbon monoxide monitors in hotels. Well, who's going to vote against that? You know, there were, there were provisions in there about whether taxi cab drivers are independent contractors or licensees or, or some other category. And, and a lot of people felt very passionately about that. It was just, it was just a hodgepodge of things, but there were many um, environmental topics in it. And, and I would, we could probably have a contest about this, but I, I would say <laughs> it was the most environmentally damaging bill of the session. So. Uh, I'm going to tell you all about a few of the provisions. Um, one was a provision that we fought in many, many bills that ended up here, and we called it the compliance boundary provision. And we started working on this issue with regard to coal ash ponds, coal ash lagoons that Senator Kennard mentioned, but it, it applies to any sort of permitted 
uh, lagoon or pond or place that has groundwater contamination. And House Bill 74 weakened the protections of our state's groundwater by extending the compliance boundary oh, yeah. from 500 feet from the source of contamination out to the property line. So if Duke Energy, for example, or ABC Company has a source of groundwater contamination on their property, they used to sort of have a free zone out to 500 feet where they had to monitor and study, and once it hit that outer ring, they had to begin remediation. Well, now it's been extended to the property line. So how do you extend your property line? Will you buy the piece of property next door, and then your property line's even further away? So it doesn't encourage fixing the problem. It requires a lot less monitoring. And, and an example that Brooks and I used at the legislature all the time, apparently fell on deaf ears, was um, the coal ash ponds at the Mountain Island Lake Riverbend Energy Facility in Charlotte. It's on the Catawba River. Um, there are coal ash ponds that are contaminating the groundwater, but the property boundary goes across the other side of the river. So it is allowing that groundwater contamination mm -hmm. to not be cleaned up, and that's the drinking water source for the city of Charlotte. So one day, somebody's going to wake up and figure out the, the negative ramifications of this. That's right. They don't like Charlotte anyway. <laughs> I know, but there's a lot of really powerful people in the legislature from Charlotte. Another thing, uh, sort of a smaller administrative thing, but it's going to have a lot of impact on our work, decrease the filing time for challenging air or water permits in the mm -hmm. state from 60 for third parties, which is usually SELC representing an environmental group or a neighboring property owner or anybody who's going to challenge a permit um, decreases the filing time for doing that from 60 days to 30 days. So any of y'all who worked for groups this summer that were filing pleadings know that cutting a time like that in half is a big deal. It's, it puts a lot of pressure. Uh, it eliminated the Mountain Resources Commission, which the legislature created in 2009 to promote sensible growth policies in Western North Carolina that also protect mountain resources and landscapes. It, it does stay true to its name, the Reg Reform Act. It created a new complicated process for reviewing and readopting state rules, and the clear intention is to repeal them. And here's a little chart. Uh, there's a copy of it up there. This shows the flow chart of, of how the process is going to work. Um, and the agencies have to go through, comb through all their rules and divide them into three buckets, uh, rules that have substantive interest, that are necessary with substantive interest, that are necessary with no substantive interest and that are unnecessary. And those that are unnecessary will just be will just be allowed to expire. Those that are necessary with substantive public interest, which means some group or entity has commented on them in the past two years, those rules will all have to be readopted. And I just can't even I don't even have the courage to show you the spreadsheet that shows how hard it is to readopt a rule. <laughs> Those that are deemed necessary without substantive pu public interest will just be allowed to remain on the book. So the agency makes that designation. It's all going to go out for public comment for 60 days. And it's going to go back to the agency. Then they have to sit in a report to the um, Rules Review Commission, which is sort of a quasi-judicial branch. Reich and Brooks and I could talk to you all for a long time about that. But this, this may have some separation of Political powers. Business group. <laughs> issues, um, but then they get to decide, well, was the agency right how they characterize the rules, or should we change that categorization, and so forth and so on. It's going to just go on forever. And of course, uh, the schedule has not even been set yet, but the legislature was kind and said that all surface water quality rules and wetlands rules in North Carolina had to be first up. So one harmful provision of this, too, is if they just don't get around to making this classification or doing public comment by a certain date that will be set by the Rules Review Commission, the rule will just expire. Mm. So it's it's scary and crazy stuff. <laughs> um, there was a provision in H-74 that prohibits cities and counties from enacting or enforcing any ordinance that requires a large employer to assume responsibility for the mitigation or impact of the employee's commute or transportation. And this already played out in Durham last week. Durham had a 13-year mm. long-standing ordinance that um, encouraged employers, I don't know the exact details of the ordinance, but encouraged employers to get their employees to carpool. And I think they had to pay $200 to join this group, and then there was a fine if they didn't comply, you know, if they didn't take, take regular surveys of their employees to see that people were carpooling. And the Durham County Commissioners met and realized that this was in violation of 
House Bill 74, so they had to uh, repeal the ordinance. Um, as Senator Kinnaird indicated, this big landfill bill, Senate Bill 328, was chipped away at, chipped away at, chipped away at, and never did get taken up by the House. So it's still live, and we could see it again, but part of it got dumped into House Bill 74. 74. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the parts that, that did get put in here are, um, it, it removes protections for low-income and minority communities by taking away any of the state environmental justice protections and leaving only in place the federal. And North Carolina actually has great environmental justice mm -hmm rules and policies so that that weakened what you were talking about about being able to place these things near minority communities um, it eliminates all buffers for any state game lands designated after july 1 of this year so if, if someone designates a game land next week you could automatically build a landfill right up beside it um, it also weakened the requirements about inspecting the leachate lines and cleaning them and, it, and then finally, it allows garbage trucks to be leak resistant rather than leak proof. So that is a distinction with a difference. And um, it means that you might see some garbage trucks leaking toxic and putrid liquids and you won't be able to say it's against the law. Um, okay, I'm getting close on time, sorry. It combines the Division of Water Quality and the Division of Water Resources, which is really, um, startling to us and it's going to involve budget cuts and staff reductions. We've already seen it play out on a reservoir in Cleveland County where the state just waived the 401 certification which had never happened in North Carolina. This all combined with the department's new mission statement of doing customer service, meaning providing better service to permit applications, permit applicants and polluters. It's just kind of set the ball rolling for what we see as the, the demise of the agency. It reduced some air quality protections. It had many billboard ramifications. Um, and lastly, as Brooks mentioned, it really limits local governments from passing ordinances with regard to the environment. Again, it singled out the environment. Didn't, didn't address health didn't address safety i'm Thank thankful goodness. for it. yes i'm thankful for that but it's just about a local government cannot pass an ordinance that is more strict than federal or state law with regard to the environment we got it maneuvered a little bit so now it's just a prohibition through this fall october 2014 while the legislature studies the issue so that's probably when the legislature is going to say local governments can't make anything more strict than federal or state law in a lot of areas that's that's what we predict Talk about the Utilities Commission where they wiped out all of the members and the Coastal Advisory. Well, and, and that ended up being in the budget, but there, there, were some, there were some bills that were completely wiping the site clean on various boards and commissions. And, and in the end, they didn't do it to the Utilities Commission, but the Coastal Resources Commission and the Environmental Management Commission were pretty much wiped clean and all new people were put in place. So we had a few months there where the Coastal Resources Commission couldn't meet I think the EMC took one meeting off while it reorganized itself, and, and you can just imagine the resumes and the qualifications of the folks that now sit on those boards and commissions. A lot of environmental requirements were removed from mm -hmm. what kind of um, skill set these folks had to have, science. It, it became more political appointees. Um, so that wasn't in H74 in the end. I think at some point it was in there and then ended up being put over in the budget. But at any rate, I could go on all day about this and I won't, y'all be glad. But um, this bill passed both chambers and was sent to the governor. And just to show you how sort of out of touch, out of sync he was with the legislature, he didn't really know all this was going on supposedly. And he said, just sort of off the cuff, I think it was like on a Friday afternoon, he was at some speech and and he said something about the landfill portion of this bill really giving him pause and, and troubling him. And it was amazing because he hadn't really said anything about the huge mega landfill bill that didn't pass, but he, so I think he thought this was it. But at any rate, we latched onto it and the environmental community, I think you guys helped, we drafted a letter to the governor asking him to veto this bill. It was the only, well, we asked him to veto that in the Jordan Lake bill, but, um, so we got some press around that. We kind of kept it alive for about another month. And on the last day, he went ahead and signed it into law. And then filed some executive orders addressing a couple of his concerns. So I think the legislature is still mad about that. And we'll figure out. Yeah, they what said that, yesterday they're going to deal with that. They're the going to deal session. with his executive orders. So 
supposed to um, put this a little bit into perspective. I have two more points, then I'll hand it over. I'm sorry. Um, this group of legislators say all the time that we want less rules. North Carolina has way too many rules. And so what do they do? They put this in place with the with regard to the rules review process. And the first thing that has to occur under that process is the Rules Review Commission has to adopt like 10 or 12 new rules. So <laughs> great job, guys. You, know, you want to eliminate rules and you're already bringing some more on. And also, it, they talk about, and the Tea Party often talks about hating big government. You don't want Big Brother watching you. You don't want the feds watching you. So then they strip local control away on the living wage requirements, the commuting ordinances, and environmental ordinances. So I'm not sure that they're reading both pages in their playbook. It, it's, <laughs> it's really strange, but those are the kind of things that they're just moving so fast and furiously. I think they forget the Earth reason values. they started, yeah. perhaps. So. Well, that's all right. They kept going. They took away a couple of airports. They, they took did. away a, couple, a water system from mm -hmm. Asheville. And then um, they went into local governments and redistricted them. Yep, and they tried to mess up Dorothy Dix Park and yeah, forced I mean, them so to annex something. Yeah. Oh, by the time. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. anyway, that was a big deal. So. We're not half. I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk um, mostly about a piece of legislation that um, was defeated um, in this term, uh, and an unusual um, victory for environmentalists and about what was at stake in that bill and then say a few things at the end um, uh, about some of the broader themes that have been involved in the last session. Um, so the bill is um, Senate Bill 648, the so-called Ag-Gag Law. The Ag stands for agricultural, the agricultural gag law. Um, this law is modeled on ones that have been introduced across the country, adopted in some states. Um, that cri they criminalize the uh, paradigmatic act of expose or whistleblowing in um, slaughterhouses and confined feeding operations in the big controversial um, industrial agriculture operations. Now, if you want to know what it looks like inside a slaughterhouse or inside a hog factory or a chicken factory, you generally speaking can't just walk up to the public relations desk and ask for a tour. Um, I've tried it. Um, I tried it once and was told that they loved to have members of the public, academics and journalists come in, but unfortunately everyone who could help me was gone for the next three months. <laughs> so could I please get back in touch with them? Um, that happened to be a unionized plant, and so I walked into the union office and convinced them to lend me a hard hat and let me walk through with one of their shop floor people. So I did see the inside of a slaughterhouse in Colorado, and it's a sobering experience, it makes you think more carefully about what you eat and where it comes from and what its life was like before you put it in your mouth. Um, and the fact that it's a thought producing um, experience looking inside those operations is of course exactly why it's not easy to get a look inside. So laws that criminalize taking unauthorized videos or photographs, otherwise recording what's going on inside those operations, then publicizing them, are attempts to shut down the debate on how we raise and use animals. Um, now, why is this an environmental issue? Um, I think at least Part of the reason, regardless whether you see animal rights as being part of environmental themes more generally, is that agriculture at large is a frontier area in environmental politics and lawmaking. There's a lot of new awareness in the last five to ten years of how deeply and pervasively food systems affect the health of ecosystems, the health of human communities, really tie those together at the metabolic level. Um, and there's a lot of energy around innovation and activism in food systems, from entrepreneurship, local farmers markets, new models of agriculture and food production, 
um, people setting up local food networks so that farm to fork or farm to table is a more available option and not only necessarily for wealthy folks but for folks at multiple income levels. Um, so <clears throat> there's a kind of, there's a cultural and a political ferment here that ties how we raise and get our food to broader questions about environmental stewardship. And as a matter of the politics of the question, um, how, animals, uh, how animals are raised and slaughtered is part of what motivates people, draws them to this issue, and makes up their minds around this issue. It's also true that confined feeding operations in particular are environmentally damaging in a way that traditional forms of integrated multi-crop and animal operations are not. Um, the essayist Wendell Berry has a nice formulation where he says that um, confined animal operations um, take a solution and break it into two problems. The solution was that small-scale animal operations used to reproduce soil fertility, reproduce natural fertility in a kind of self-contained cycle because the animals survived by living off the um, grains and grasses produced on the land and returned that fertility to the land in the form of manure. Um, in a concentrated industrial scale operations, animal waste is a major source of water pollution and air pollution because it's a sort of concentrated industrial scale problem that you have to get rid of and put somewhere. Um, and because it's not returning to the ground as fertilizer, fertilizer has, fertility has to be provided by artificial fertilizers, which produce their own set of environmental problems, not least um, runoff into waterways. Um, so there are a lot of reasons to be interested in how we do um, animal husbandry or animal, animal um, industry from the environmental point of view. Um, it also mattered that it was happening in North Carolina, the attempt to shut down the debate about agriculture, because North Carolina is really marked by having two strong and very different paradigms of agriculture happening in the same state. On the one hand, this region in particular, but not only this region, is a real hotbed of innovative agricultural activity. People um, farming in small, sustainable, new or neo-traditional ways with a lot of um, with a lot of support and enthusiasm from surrounding urban communities, the urban communities that they surround. Um, so there's a lot of innovation here. At the same time, North Carolina is a um, total redoubt of the um, sort of late 20th century hyper-industrial style of food production, especially meat production. You go out into the countryside, especially, I think, out east, but, it, but in much of the state, and you see huge metal buildings just packed wall to wall with hogs and chickens. We do a lot of these confined operations here. So um, trying to shut down the debate about those confined operations and whether they're the kind of agricultural future that we want is especially salient in a state where there are kind of two pictures of the environmental future for agriculture happening side by side and fighting and fighting it out. <clears throat> so why, um, why did the bill get defeated? I was out of the state when it happened and my contribution was to talk to people at the national um, level in the animal welfare organizations, like especially the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, and contribute an op-ed in the Raleigh News and Observer to what they to what they were doing. Um, my sense is that there were a couple of things, at least, that were at play. Um, one is that this bill, although it was an ag gag bill of the kind we're describing, was also more than an ag gag bill. It applied its penalties to employees in all sorts of industries, who empl uh, employees or visitors who um, publicized 
images, documents, or material that they picked up without permission, snapping pictures, inside um, company facilities. So that meant that it would have, for example, forbidden the network news undercover investigation in North Carolina in the early 90s that found that the Food Lion um, grocery chain was marketing a cheese that had been gnawed by rats and meat whose expiration date had spoiled, which all got exposed by um, network reporters who took jobs working in the back of Food Lion and took pictures of what was going on there. Um, it also would have um, criminalized the, um, the expose 20 years later, just this past year, of um, employee abuses of turkeys in the butterball turkey plants in North Carolina, which involved a lot of just really nasty kinds of violence that violated state animal welfare, animal cruelty laws. So we had some salient examples in the state, both in agriculture and out of agriculture, of the kind of benefit to public information and public debate that can happen um, from this kind of whistleblowing or expose. Um, and um, the national animal welfare organizations, which care a lot about um, what happens in industrial ag, have strong and well-organized national networks of advocates and citizen advocates, and they cut across some of the conventional party lines, and I know that they mobilized their people in the state. I assume that had, that had something to do with the eventual defeat. Um, so, um, a, a, couple, a couple of quick thoughts to, um, to wrap it up. Should we be in favor of undercover investigations, um, whistleblowing, people sneaking in where they're, uh, where they're not supposed to be and taking pictures? <clears throat> it's not ideal. Um, and the reasonableness, such as it was, of the North Carolina ag gag law had to do with the observation that, in fact, when you get a job, and you're actually an undercover reporter, you are in fact playing a kind of trick on the person who's employed you. Um, and they do have an interest in knowing whom they're hiring in the same way that in any of our contractual dealings we have an interest in knowing who's on the other side of the table. My view is that the public interest in knowing what's going on inside um, facilities in which the public has an interest, whether for established reasons like public health, the food lion example, or because there's ongoing serious political and moral controversy about what's going on in there, like in industrial feeding facilities, that public interest is stronger than the company's interest in privacy and fair dealing. But there are better, there might be better ways of achieving it. Um, mandatory disclosure of what happens inside slaughterhouses through, for example, strategically placed webcams all over the slaughterhouse that you could access through a URL that would be part of the packaging on the meat you bought at the supermarket, for example, would contribute some of the same kind mm -hmm. of public awareness and starting point for a debate as the animal welfare expose missions. So I think we could think about legal reforms that would accomplish some of what whistleblowers accomplish in a less complicated way. But unless and until that happens, and that's not going to happen here anytime soon, I think whistleblowers are doing a very unimportant public service in this area, which contributes to issues at the intersection of environmental and sort of quasi-environmental, like animal welfare issues. Um, I guess the, the, last, the last thing I'd say is I just um, and this is not this is not about the environmental issue at all. Actually, this is about your ter your terrific observations in particular, Mary, about um, landowners' rights and local autonomy, which are both big issues for Tea Party voters and grassroots Tea Party advocates, but get rapidly sold out mm -hmm. by a Tea Party legislature when they stand in the way of the kinds of economic development that their constituencies want to see. I think this is actually the paradox of right-wing populism in general in the US now, that its constituency is a libertarian constituency that mistrusts concentrated power 
and it mistrusts far away power. And for good reasons in many cases, whether that far away power is big banks or the federal government that bailed out the big banks. But the constituency that Tea Party legislators answer to is a constituency itself of concentrated power and usually distant power. Um, big energy companies and big agriculture mm -hmm. companies not least. And they're um, less interested in the autonomy of local North Carolina communities and the autonomy of landowners than any, um, any DC bureaucrat that the voters are afraid of. So that is, that is, I think, a paradox that North Carolina is seeing. When you vote against government in the contemporary political configuration, you don't get less government. You get government for in someone else's service. And that's the, that, that is just the actual concrete character of the decision. Professor, did you know that Governor McCrory's wife is an animal rights advocate? No, I didn't. See, that's the kind of thing. I wonder that, if yeah. maybe that has something to do it with it. It might that. very well have. It was allowed, to, she, she, yeah, was exactly. allowed to die in committee, but maybe he, mm -hmm. they. That might have helped yes. a little bit. Yeah, she could, a could I comment on a couple of things very quickly? The, on fracking, um, they had hearings all over the state because they said they wanted to, uh, public input. And I went to two of them, and I know the same was true all over overwhelmingly people said, we do not want fracking in North Carolina. And they completely ignored that. And, and now you see on the, on the news, a lot of TV ads for natural um, gas as a clean industry, but the methane, which is a, contributing more to climate um, warming, actually is worse than the coal fired fossil fuel burning. And, and um, I want to say one last thing. Um, when I talked to one of the members on the um, Energy Mining Commission, he's from Chapel Hill, he said there's not much natural gas here. And the price is so low, and there's such abundance everywhere else, that it's really not worth coming in here and fracking. Well, that's why they, I guess, yesterday we were talking about setting up incentives and reducing land, you know, make it the wild, wild west. It's the only way these people are going to come here because it's not worth Yeah, yesterday time. Senator Rucho mm -hmm. said that natural gas is the key to, I um, can't remember the phrase, for, for energy independence in North Carolina. Oh. Speaking <laughs> as if we were a country, we can't, <laughs> from dangerous Virginia, we can't take their energy Notable anymore. Notable that he is a dentist from Charlotte, so he has and I no wanted, skin in any of the game. And the, the <laughs> preliminary um, tests show that if we used all of our natural gas in, to fuel North Carolina, it would last about five years. So we would get energy independence for five years, and then we'd have to go back to there, there's one principle about this last legislature, and that is you can present facts, you can present logic, you <laughs> could even prevent, present moral imperatives, um, made no difference whatsoever. Just all those facts, forget it, like no natural gas. And I mean, it was the most frustrating time because there was no reason for what, what you could logically do and, and things like I've gone through those chicken houses where there are 10,000 chickens in an area about this big. And, but you bring these, these facts and, and logic to the debate, and it goes nowhere. So we're all, we were all very frustrated last year. But last Senator Carr never gave up. She spoke out every time we asked her to. We, we tried. can't tell you how much that means. We tried. <laughs> you did. And Josh, a wonderful You kid. succeeded on some instances. Um, so, if anyone has any questions, they can email the panelists or email I left me our cards up here, too. Oh, did you have some lines? I did. Yeah. 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 Yeah.